Good to see you all today. I didn't ask for the applause for me and Jenna, but it was very kind of you to do that. Um, Jenna, if I could get the video later, I do want to look and see if Josephine Drogi was uh, applauding. Um, <laughs> and also, uh, thank you from Jenna and from me for lots of kind notes and cards and words last week and the last several weeks for both of us as we get ready to move on to do something different. Though I do feel like the staff is kind of ready for me to go. <laughs> Our director of facilities asked me a couple of weeks ago when I could get my office cleaned out. She's really excited to get it all clean and ready for Sarah. I apologize for using my office and told her I'll try to get out of there as soon as I can. On the table in my office, there are two large welcome to second baskets for Sarah. You'd think that could have waited just a few days, uh, couldn't you? And then Jenna took my computer back uh, to get it ready for Sarah. And I walked by her office, I noticed her like spraying it, wiping it down. She had like a little mini vacuum. It's a little hard not to take that personally, uh, sanitizing the thing. So yes, I'm leaving, don't worry. <laughs> Sometimes when communities are facing change, there can be a tendency to become tense or tight, rigid or fearful. Times of transition are times of uncertainty. And there's a lot of uncertainty in our lives right now. As a country headed into a political season, as a congregation, getting ready to welcome a new pastor, as a city always under construction, and as families facing the future. Yet faith teaches us that uncertainty isn't a problem to be solved, it's a reality to be lived with. Not knowing names the arena in which we are called to love God and our neighbors. So two readings from Scripture today. Uh, the first is an account of Solomon, King Solomon's prayer as he dedicates the temple he has built in Jerusalem. So this first reading from 1 Kings 8. So listen now for God's voice speaking to you. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love with your servants who walk before you with all their heart, the covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. He says about the temple he's built, but will God indeed dwell on the earth, even Heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you sh said, My name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Likewise, when foreigners who are not of your people Israel come from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When foreigners come and pray toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigners ask of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel." And so they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. Our second reading comes from Ephesians 6. It's not exactly a call to arms, so it sounds like that. It's more like a call for all of us to wake up and realize that God has called us into a good fight, into making some good trouble together. So again now, listen for God's voice to you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of God's power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on the evil day and having prevailed against everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and belt your waist with truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness. Lace up your sandals in preparation for the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak a message, I may, uh, uh, that when I speak a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. May God bless the reading of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. You may have noticed the quirky title of today's sermon, so let me begin with uh, Black Holes. What uh, next couple of paragraphs here are from uh, Jack Underwood's book titled Not Even This, Poetry, Parenthood, and Living Uncertainly. The center of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is about 26,000 light years from us. That's a long way. It is thoroughly obscured by large clouds of dust. No information that we could perceive with our naked eyes could ever reach us from out beyond that cosmic cloud dust weather front. But there's a German astronomer named Reinhard Ginzel. You knew he was German without me saying that, right, Reinhard? He has turned the instrument of infrared radiation toward the center of our galaxy, and this allowed Reinhard and other astronomers to measure and then eventually chart the velocities and orbits of the stars closest to the galactic center, and then that that allowed them to build up a description of what's going on there. That what, the, what they found is a truly extreme environment where the velocity of the orbiting stars was so great and the mass of that region so compacted that there could only be one explanation, that our galaxy is organi- organized around a supermassive black hole, which has the name of Sagittarius A. That black hole has a mass more than four million times that of our own sun. Now, our galaxy is not unique. Other neighboring galaxies work in the same way. They, too, have a supermassive black hole at their nucleus. But our organizing center here in the Milky Way, Sagittarius A, has overseen the relatively stable conditions in which all intelligent life that we are aware of has evolved. So think about this. All human knowledge, activity, and experience has derived from the circumstantial conditions created by an object that we humans never experience directly and that will always keep the fundamentals of its nature hidden from us. Here's how Jack Underwood closes out this section. Quote, a black hole is a perfect analogy for uncertainty, for how life and reality always transcend what you can know. Now back to our reading from 1 Kings 8 and King Solomon. Of course, science and faith aren't the same thing. Astronomical discoveries about Sagittarius A aren't the same as talking about practices that help us trust in a loving God. And yet, the posture of curiosity and wonder often marks both the work of science and the work of faith. In science, like in faith, there's a lot of not knowing. So in our reading today from the First Testament, Solomon has replaced his father David as king of the newly reunited Israel. King Solomon has been tasked with building a temple in Jerusalem that would be the dwelling place for God, for Israel's God. Solomon, a political leader also responsible for guarding the faith of God's people, 
Solomon certainly understands the symbolic importance of a central unified place of worship in Jerusalem. But Solomon doesn't use the symbolic power of the temple to consolidate his own political power. Instead, he stays somehow playful and curious. Can God really dwell on earth, Solomon asks. The highest heavens can't contain God, how much less this temple, however beautiful, however stunning. Solomon, despite all of his problems, and he had a few, we all do, Solomon models for us how to build something big and enduring that still embraces the not knowing at the heart of life. His prayer acknowledges that there's no temple, no place, no people, no categories that could ever capture God's oceanic aliveness. His prayer acknowledges that what we build ought to be expansive enough, spacious enough to welcome and benefit even those unfamiliar, unknown to us, the foreigner in Solomon's prayer. There isn't any housing, any dwelling, any container for God. God is the energy or force of love that contains all things. Yes, we Christians confess that God was gladly housed in the human body of Jesus from Nazareth. And Jesus marks for us the way the divine can dwell in time and space, in materiality, in flesh, in history. This is not a God scared of contamination, not a God hovering safely above the messiness of our actual lives. No, Jesus shows us that God is pleased to dwell within material creation and among ordinary creatures like you and me. Of course, nothing ever contains God, not temples, not churches, not religions, especially not our catechisms and commentaries, nor even our political and moral ideas. And yet God is here. God is always here, always fully, blazingly alive and here. And this brings me to the parable of the pearl. I said two readings, I'm sneaking in a third. This one's short. From Matthew 13, don't blink, you'll miss this, it's quick. Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went, he sold all that he had, and he bought it. Times of transition are times of uncertainty, and when we're uncertain, we're sometimes pulled towards fear, and when we get afraid, we can sometimes want to be safe. Fear can make it hard for us to take risks, to act decisively. But here is a parable that gives us this whole framework for a new way of living. If God is the lively energy of love, always here, always closer to us than our own breath, then our whole lives might be considered something like a crisis or an opportunity. Usually in the Gospels, crisis and opportunity, they're just the same thing. But an opportunity for repentance and for renewal. The parable Jesus tells calls forth a conversation both within ourselves and with others about the search for a satisfying, sustainable life. It puts to us the question of what we're noticing, what's getting our attention. Jesus tells a tiny little story that opens us into the widest possible space, the space of desire, of purpose, of meaning, of orientation, of directionality. What do we want? What do we really want? How have we organized our various allegiances? Which way are we facing? On what are we waiting? And for what are we working? What path, among all the possible paths, what path are we traveling? Those are just a few of the wonderful, terrible, vexing, perplexing, and beautiful questions that emerge in the hearing of this tiny little parable. The pot that gets stirred in us by this parable is a gift from God, even if it feels a little uncomfortable. Parables are hard, and this one's no exception. This simple little story may not be as simple, though, as it sounds on first hearing. Jesus' parables always remind us that we're in the presence of a masterful storyteller. First, there's this tricky image of the kingdom of heaven. What is it? What is that? And where is it in our own experience that we can find it, locate it, participate in it? And if we take our cues from the merchant's search for pearls, how is this kingdom related to our desires, our desire for wholeness, 
for happiness, for pleasure, for joy, for satisfaction, for meaning, and for healing. Second, there's this image of the pearl of great value or the pearl of great price. Jesus' original hearers were first century Mediterranean Jews nestled into particular trade routes, economic structures, so they would have easily connected to the story. For that culture, pearls were an obvious marker of value. So his hearers don't have to waste any energy trying to figure out what he means. They get to reserve all their energy for the real task in the hearing, which is responding to the crisis in which the story places all of us. So third and finally, there's the behavior of this odd merchant. She works, waits, watches, goes about her task, and then on an ordinary day, it happens. Lightning strikes. The unthinkable event ruptures her expectations, and there it is, the most gorgeous pearl she's ever seen. One so dazzling in beauty that she had never even imagined it was possible. Life cannot be this lucky, this fortuitous, this coincidental, but it is, and the pearl appears. And by appearing, it creates a crisis on an epic scale. Do I stand here admiring the pearl and then take a pass, telling myself that I can't afford it? Or do I go for broke? Do I push all the chips in? Do I leverage myself to the hilt? Do I jettison everything I've accumulated, learned, achieved, valued, so that I can free up the resources for this breathtaking, once-in-a-life treasure? So we're merchants on the lookout for valuable pearls. We're also, as our reading from Ephesians suggests, soldiers and warriors, and this role might sound odd to you as well. Can we see ourselves as people called to engage in a fight? Not just believing a few things, not just belonging in a membership kind of way to some church or other organization. Can we really picture ourselves as engaged in a ferocious battle, not with other people, but with forces that block belovedness? Friends, faith doesn't make you a wilting flower a fearful, timid conflict avoider. Rather, it energizes you. It lights your fire. It flips your switch. It turns you on. It focuses your efforts. Of course, life won't be easy. God's love isn't victorious in any sort of obvious or easy way we could point to. God's love has to fight for all its gains. It has to wrestle for space in the world. And our faith makes us strong, equipped and outfitted for precisely these kinds of challenges. Faith allows us to fight without making monsters of all the people who disagree with us. It's a new kind of fighting. Now, some of you may be fond of dressing up, costuming yourself whenever you get the chance for Halloween, other parties, whatever. Not me so much. Some of you engage in cosplay, dressing up as your favorite character. Good for you. Well, whether you're a person who likes costuming or wouldn't ever be caught dead doing so, this passage from Ephesians invites us to at least imagine ourselves outfitted as capable, strong warriors, capable of decisive action in ambiguous, uncertain contexts. This picture of faith, dressed in armor, ready for battle, reminds me of the adventures of Don Quixote, the Spanish wandering knight fictionalized by Cervantes in the early 17th century. At the beginning of the novel, and it's a long one, uh, we learn that Don Quixote couldn't stop reading the medieval accounts of knights brave in battle and chivalrous with women. So taken was Quixote with these traveling writers of wrongs and doers of justice that he, well, sort of loses his marbles. And so at about age 50, he got his grandfather's rusty ar armor out of storage and he tries it on. It didn't fit, but he doesn't mind. The ill-fitting helmet had a visor that didn't work. It was missing a strap, so Quixote fixed this challenge by simply tying uh, the, the helmet on with some green ribbon, knotting it under his chin. He deputized his skinny nag of a broken-down horse to be a stallion fitting for a brave knight and renamed her Rocinante. And one night, Quixote put on his armor, mounted Rocinante, and set out across the countryside to right wrongs and to save damsels in distress. That's all the first chapter. 
<laughs> the rest of the novel is a gag reel of bungling attempts by Quixote to enact the ancient tradition of the brave wandering knight. Though he doesn't know it, he's a laughing stock to all who encounter him. So addicted is he to these romantic tales of knights, castles, and damsels in distress that he miscalculates every single situation. Perhaps this image of the silly figure of Don Quixote will serve as a warning for all of us to be a little careful about how we wear this armor of faith. And yet there's also something wonderful, I think, about Quixote's foolishness, his lust for adventure, his intuition that there really is something at stake, something worth fighting for. Perhaps there's something about all of that that can guide us deeper into the ways our faith tangles us up in a faithful way to fight. Parables like this one about the pearl, these are interesting little creatures. They aren't really about anything. They're more like doors that open for a moment, like a fastball thrown down the middle when the count is full, like a treasure that materializes but then immediately begins to deteriorate if you don't drop everything immediately to grab it. A parable is a crisis, always a crisis. When we hear this parable today, it creates a crisis for each of us and for all of us. You can have a life that's bigger and more beautiful than you ever imagined, and we together can build a community life more profound and purposeful than we had ever dreamed. But the moment is now, and it will cost us absolutely everything. Amen.